understand me. Ha figures up if you can understand what I'm saying. Very good. Think what it's called. Cool. Good. Okay. So, uh, Robert Shulman, uh, I lead the area uh, of uh, research and knowledge management for Israel and several other countries. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is uh, to share some of our experience from Google Israel in the area of export and innovation. I'll start off by giving a little bit of uh, background about Israel and about the innovation scene in Israel. Then I'll discuss three, three brief case studies that exemplify some of the uh, issues that we've been discussing here today. And then finally, I'll discuss with you some of the some insights that I have uh, observed based on these case studies and our experience in Google Israel around the area of export. So, Israel. So first of all, Israel is a pretty small country, right? Uh, from an area point of view, it's about four times, uh, one quarter the size of the Czech Republic. Um, from a GDP per capita point of view, so the per capita is somewhat on par with that of southern Europe, so in between Spain and Portugal. So nothing terribly exciting about the Israel, Israel on the left side. Small country, average GDP. But on the right side here, we, we, we discuss aspirations. Okay, so Israel, or more, to be more precise, Israelis, typified by great aspirations, especially around the areas of innovation and export. So first of all, recently a, uh, uh, um, a study by Startup Genome actually ranked Israel as having the second strongest startup ecosystem in the world after Silicon Valley. How, do, how does Israel drive this startup e ecosystem? So first of all, look at the, the graph just below that. Israel actually invests the highest percentage in the world as a percentage of GDP in research and development. Look at the graph below that. So the, that actually shows that um, among Twelve or fifteen different countries that were looked at in a study by McKinsey, where they tried to estimate the portion of the GDP that was driven by the internet. The country with the highest portion driven by the internet was Israel. Now, I'm not going to try even try to explain how this calculation was done because. Uh, I saw uh, the drilling that was received by uh, uh, the, the speakers before me when they started discussing GDP. So I'm not going to go there. But um, what, what I can tell you is that for Israel specifically, the majority of that 6.4% is actually driven by exports. So it's the external activity that, Google, that uh, Israel does, not the internal activity around the internet. So, on this slide here are several examples of Israeli exporters. Most of them fall under the category of what I would call startups. Um, there are some great examples here. Um, Waze, for example, was recently purchased by Google. Uh, Viber was recently uh, um, purchased by a Japanese company. And um, just last week, Kit Locate was actually purchased by Yandex. So the, the, the large international firms, um, primarily the American ones, but more and more, not just the American ones, are actually understanding the value of the, of the, the innovation that's going on there, and are moving into the country. Now then, what it drives the startup ecosystem. Where does it come from? So, our president, Shimon Peres, likes to explain that essentially Israel itself is a startup. So, the founding fathers, when they came 
to set up Israel about 100 years ago. They were doing this against unbelievable hurdles. Everybody told them it is impossible, it's not going to work. And they believed, and they did it nonetheless, and that ethos survives in the Israeli startup ecosystem. So if you're going to if you're going to innovate, you have to believe in the impossible. And that is what's driving the, the innovation. Larry Page, Google CEO, likes to set us what he calls uncomfortably exciting targets. That means targets that when we receive them, we say, ah, I can't do that. It's impossible. But then we understand, uh, maybe it is possible. And then the, 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 the setting of these crazy targets, of, of, of telling yourself, look, I'm not going to improve things by 10%. I'm going to improve things by 10 times. I'm not going to you know, work on the margin. I'm going to go for the world. Now then, that is the essence of export. It's saying, I'm not going to work on you know, improving slightly in my own country. I am going to see the world as my oyster, and I'm going to address the entire world, even though it really seems almost impossible. So I'm going to provide you with three case studies here. Now, they're all very, very different kind of cases. But I chose them all because, one, they all leverage the internet. And two, more importantly, they all had the temerity to believe in the impossible, to believe that they could be far more than they were. And, you know, they're, they're, they're totally different. The first one is an established manufacturer. The second one is a small family business. And the third one is an internet startup. All different, but all very similar. Let's start off with SodaStream. So SodaStream was actually, well, what is SodaStream? They're a manufacturer of soda machines. Soda machines are very simply machines. You take water, you go, you get soda. Okay, that's a soda machine. They were actually born in 1901 in the United Kingdom, the uh, soda stream. Um, and uh, at first it was like a product for upper class families. And in 1998, they were united with Soda Club, an Israeli company. And the headquarters are now in Israel. So since 2000, they started a gradual expansion to more and more countries. First the US, then Germany, and now they're in 39 different countries. Um, as you can see, they are growing at a phenomenal rate. And it's interesting to note that th this recent spate of growth is strongly correlated with their using the internet in order to, to uh, drive their sales and uh, for international marketing. Now, how do they do that? So, some interesting points about how they work. So, similarly to what we heard with, uh, regarding Skoda, they use distributors around the world. Nonetheless, they manage their marketing and their branding in a religious way across the entire globe. So they actually promote their distributors. Um, second of all, and this is very, very important, they are very aggressive with their marketing, with their advertising. They advertise everywhere, on Google, on Facebook, on Bing, um, they're online, offline, all the time. They never give up. And the third interesting point is that they really rode on the green ticket. So what do I mean? In their, um, much of their advertising, they compare themselves to the large uh, drinks manufacturers, right, to, to Coke and to Pepsi, and they explain how, unlike with Coke and Pepsi, there's no waste, right, so that's the green ticket. Now, what was the big advantage of this, except for the green advantage? It, 
they position themselves as competitors to the big guys. That's about thinking big, right? Um, now then, how do they do this? There's some cool examples. Well, the first thing they did, they set up enormous cages uh, in airports and other public places like that. And they filled these enormous cases with thousands of empty bottles. And then they put one small soda machine next to that, the, this cage. And under it, we would say, with one soda machine, you could have saved all these bottles in one year. Next, they upped their ante. And they bought some big TV, some really expensive TV spots in the UK. And in these spots, they attacked Pepsi and Coke. Pepsi and Coke hated that. What did they do? They knew, uh, uh, so Pepsi and Coke actually got their advertisements banned just before they were about to go on. Now, Soda Street was stuck with these spots, and then they had a stroke of genius. They put a black screen on the TV. People were watching TV, and suddenly they get a black screen. And then Soda Street, the, sort of, they just say, our advertisements were banned, so we can't show them to you here, but you can see them on YouTube. Millions of people flock to YouTube. Believe me, Coke and Pepsi were really sorry about the mistake they made. <laughs> Nonetheless, one year later, uh, Soda Street upped their ante once more. They purchased the world's most expensive, most exclusive advertising real estate. Who knows what that might be? Super Bowl. Super Bowl, exactly. They purchased spots on the Super Bowl. But once again, their bands, their ads, sorry, their ads were banned. This time, Coke and Pepsi learned from their mistake. They made sure that uh, the, the Pepsi, that uh, Soda Street weren't were filling the, the screen with uh, with the uh, with the black with the black screen, and the, the the sort of the money was returned to, to Soda Street. But this time, Soda Street had got their PR machine working so well, they didn't even need that black screen. They were able, just through PR, to drive millions and millions of views. Um, so this is just an example that, of you know, five million views of this, uh, this advertisement. And let's like, take a look at the advertisements. Can you play it, please? Operating in. 
So despite being a small company, an SMB essentially, the, she, her company has really understood that she must go really, really local. And so here's just a quick example of going local in Japan. Those glasses on. They 
take a picture of themselves, and then you put the glasses on them. Uh, now, a little bit about entering new markets. So first of all, do leverage the internet to, to, dis, to help you decide what places to enter. Second of all, when you think about entering a new country, um, your brand is going to be relatively weak there. So you've got two potential strategies, right? One is to leverage uh, the internet as a pure performance tool, right? And then for, for pure performance, uh, just as a sales tool, you, your, the brand is important, but not as important. The second uh, uh, strategy could be to really, really invest in driving your, uh, your uh, brand up and invest heavily in branding. And again, you can do that via the internet. Um, then the last idea might be to use or would call innovative approaches. So uh, a cool example of an, a really innovative approach is a company called My Name Necklace. And they basically use that name, My Name Necklace, translated into all uh, languages of the countries that they're in. And the domain name is simply My Name Necklace. What is the big advantage of that? They always come up first in organic search, whenever anybody looks for, how can I put my name on a necklace? Um, and then the final uh, point around where to sell. So uh, classically, the classic country to sell in has been the United States, very established e-commerce market. Um, and then to move on to the English, other English speaking countries. Um, Moving, sort of looking forward, uh, I'd say that emerging markets are an area that are really, really interesting when you look at sort of growth potential. If you look at where the, the growth, most of the growth in the world is going to be coming from in the next 10, 15 years, almost all of it is going to be coming from emerging markets. So that's it for me. Thank you very, very much.